So Craig, thank you very much for agreeing to come and talk with us today. We're, we're a group, we've been meeting up to look at uh, the use of virtual consultations in chiropractic sessions. I was really interested to hear some of your posts that you've been doing this for a, for a while to support coaching or mentoring. I know the group's really interested to hear what you've got to say. So we'll let you say what you want to say. And then as a group, we've got some, some questions we'd like to share with you, if we may, and, and be interested to hear your answers. Awesome. So I can uh, hand over to you. Oh, gosh, pressure. <laughs> so um, telehealth is something I've been um, following for a couple of years. The literature on e-health and uh, M health, uh, different names now telehealth, has been coming in fairly promising. Uh, a recent study on OA of the knee showed that uh, actually people are more satisfied with it uh, than face-to-face, -face, shockingly. And the interesting thing that I'm finding from telehealth is, as other people who've been doing it longer have, have noted, is that you can address the biopsychosocial far more easily, namely because people aren't um, a slave of their expectation of their PT or chiro or osteopath that we're going to fix, do a fix it session. Um, so it's easier uh, with a little distance uh, and them being in the comfort of their home uh, to be able to talk about stressors, to be able to talk about um, uh, issues that maybe are hampering or impairing their confidence, self-efficacy, um, other things that maybe we don't have time to address in the clinic setting where all the focus has gone to, uh, oh, I feel my QL, oh, I have a little crick in my neck, can you take the pressure off, doc, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the nocebos, all the, all the medicalization of normality, as uh, they put it in Australia, uh, ben Smith and Peter O'Sullivan at all, um, has become less something that we're drawn into by, by hook and crook. Um, and I got some messages, one from uh, uh, South Africa, a chiropractor who said, um, and I shared this on my webinar series that we're doing during COVID-19, um, he said that we're panicking, we're afraid, um, we don't know what to do. Uh, we're used to using our hands. Uh, and so chiropractors are very uncertain right now. Um, uh, a, a, uh, not a professor, but one of the uh, audit leaders or administrators, a chiropractor studying her for her PhD in Wales at one of the Cairo schools there, she made the comment that, um, uh, that the chiropractors are, are not up to date on what to do if they're not using their hands. And so they're feeling lost. Uh, the young ones especially um, don't know what their role is. So boy, Neil and Anna know this intimately um, since the late 90s. Uh, I think what we've been teaching is based on the work of Professor Yonda and Dr. Kara Levitt from Prague. Levitt famously said, uh, rehab is about teaching people uh, what they can do for themselves. It's about self-care. Um, and so rehab has always been about active care over passive care. It's always about, been about autonomy and independence. It's always been about self-efficacy and confidence. It's always been about the very thing that holds people back from Kairos, which is this feeling that will make people dependent, uh, this feeling that will want them to keep coming back. Um, and the solution has always been right there in front of us. Simply show people what they can do for themselves and you'll open up a whole, a whole vein of, of referrals when the word goes out that you're not just helping people uh, get out of pain, but you're also doing prevention. Um, so self-care, rehab is self-care. Um, and self-care is best practices. According to the Lancet expose, education and exercise or the sine qua non, no different than in the CSAG in the early 80s or mid, late 80s, early 90s um, from the Royal College of General Practitioners. Uh, the initial guidelines all posited that uh, evidence-based practice was reassurance and reactivation. So Lancet didn't come up with anything new. We just have all done such a horrible job at knowledge translation 
that in spite of all of our best efforts at dissemination, implementation has been poor uh, for a host of social reasons, one of which the woman and the chiropractor in Wales pointed out, people are expecting us to do this, these fix it things. So we've been giving them what they want um, and we have paid for it. Uh, and now we never uh, became agile. We were never prepared for the black swan uh, of this unexpected event. But the silver lining um, of all this is the unanticipated benefit is self-care is uh, rehab, uh, self-care is telehealth. Um, telehealth is ideally suited for building autonomy and self-confidence, for allowing the conversations that Matt Lowe in Portsmouth uh, talks about in great, great uh, rich detail uh, about uh, the social aspects and the psychological aspects um, so that we're not just focused on the biomechanical aspects or the biomedical aspects. And I think this is a great opportunity. Um, uh, there's a Grateful Dead uh, lyric by Robert Hunter, their lyricist, uh, um, um, that uh, uh, you can get shown the light if you, if, if, if you, look, if you look in the strangest places, um, uh, you can get shown the light. Um, and I think that's what's happening right now is because of this black swan, we're behaviorally constrained. We're socially constrained. This is the ultimate, uh, as Paul McCambridge talks about, um, one of your great uh, British experts um, in dynamic systems theory, we're constrained right now. And this constraint is actually bringing out something in us that has always been latent, but which we've never, due to uh, the social acceptance and the easy money and the easy uh, uh, access to, to fix it approaches, we've never had to tap in and mine these, these other resources that have laid dormant within all of us to educate people. And it's really the more ancient role of a healer. Uh, the Hygiene School from Greece was about education and teaching. Uh, it's the Eschelian school, which sadly, uh, the Fix-It school uh, of orthodox allopathy, which chiropractors, for some unknown reason, got um, uh, seduced into. Um, and we forgot that, that because we lay ha hands on people, um, that we can also touch people symbolically and metaphorically. We can touch people with our empathy. We're great communicators. We gain trust. We give people hope. Uh, we give them a tangible plan. Uh, we don't just say you have wear and tear, it's gloom and doom, you're 50, learn to live with it. Um, we're up on the science. We know it's not wear and tear. We know that there's more arthritis today than there was in the 1940s or in the industrial age or in prehistoric times amongst cave people. And yet we're more sedentary today. So how can it be wear and tear? We're exposing these myths uh, of degeneration, of myths about needing to have a scan to figure out what's wrong. Uh, we can do a functional assessment. We can assess anything other than looking inside your ear through telehealth. We can watch people do a squat and a lunge and, and, and we can see if they're holding the breath. We can ask them to, to tell us what they feel and when they can't talk and they have to, to breathe, we could see that they failed the talk test, which is the test of breathing. Um, Levitt said, unless breathing is normalized, no other movement pattern can be. And you don't have to be in the room with the person to see that, that they, they, when they start to do novel things or strenuous things that they're breath holding. So for a variety of reasons, and I don't really wanna uh, uh, talk too much, I wanna hear your questions more. Um, for a variety of reasons, telehealth is actually um, something which has uh, the opportunity to make us better than who we were before and to position us for the future and to enhance the knowledge translation, which has been poor pan-professionally. I mean, physios are very guilty of not even knowing what the physical activity guidelines are of the World Health Organization, our CDC, or other, other groups around the world, including in Great Britain. Um, they don't know that, that we should all be recommending 30 minutes a day of moderate intensity activity, and that we should be recommending twice a week of strength training. Um, and where do we come in? Well, we don't come in providing special expertise about, about how to do 30 minutes of general activity that's moderate intensity. We simply have to encourage it. So we need to reassure and reactivate and tell people that hurt doesn't equal harm, uh, which is a crucial 
um, aspect of the cognitive stinking thinking beliefs that people have that they get from nocebo uh, 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 ideas emanating from practitioners of which chiros are almost just as guilty as, as orthos and general practitioners. Um, but I think, I think that uh, uh, the beautiful thing through telehealth is that if we look at the physical activity guidelines, where we really are needed, besides reassurance and activation regarding the 30 minutes a day of general activity, uh, is to help people understand what their, their glitch is, where their floor is. Um, it's not the activity that breaks people down, it's the activity they're not prepared for. So the twice a week resistance training that the guidelines are all recommending and that most physios aren't even familiar with, um, uh, and chiros too, I assume, um, this requires some supervision at first. We have to assess, we have to observe to see whether it's the squat, whether it's the lunge, whether it's the balance, whether it's the breathing, whether it's pushing, pulling, carrying, whatever. We have to see whether it's hip mobility or thoracic spine mobility. We want to find the floor. Um, as Clint Eastwood said in Dirty Harry, a man's got to know his limitations. And it's our job to highlight, just as a cardiologist or a general practitioner or internist does when they're doing a blood pressure screen. It's called a silent uh, killer. We want to we help people to see how there are dysfunctions where we can easily, without interventionism, with very little downside risk, make an impact on. We can build strength. People over the age of 70 who have been sedentary for two or more decades, they have lost at least 30% of their muscle mass and more of their strength. Um, this is reversible. This is called sarcopenia. It's the osteoporosis of the next decade. And it's more important now that people are living longer. Um, the, the health span is gotten shorter. Our biological age, which is the number of candles we should blow out, not our chronological age, has been shrinking even while our chronological age has been lengthening. And of course, outrun your biological age. So now the chronological age is not expanding anymore. But the gap we wanna close, and we've been getting older, younger. You have a study from London on octogenarians who are endurance cyclists and they have the T cells of 20 year olds. So we know these are reversible func functional pathologies of the motor system as Levitt said. And the twice a week resistance training, not motor control exercises, not the big three, not DNS. I mean, throw away rehab of the spine second edition if you have it. First edition was a, was a hell of a lot more more consistent with, with the science that, that Paul McCandridge talks about, dynamic systems theory, constraint space motor learning. Forget about motor control. Matt Lowe wrote an incredible editorial in JOSPT about how ideas about stabilization are not that science-based. They're not very evidence-based. And he explains the history of this. Lederman talked about that, E.L. Lederman exposing this myth um, a lot of these things are nocebos. Giving people fear of flexion, follow Peter O'Sullivan on Twitter, fear of flexion, Kieran O'Sullivan, JP Canero, Ben Smith. These are incredible experts explaining to us how a lot of our ideas that we thought were, were, were on solid ground, we kind of went too far. We may have given people inordinate fear of flexion. We may be as much uh, uh, somebody who's providing a nocebo to people as the surgeon who says you have a big herniated disc or a narrow spinal canal, which we know half the time are false positives. Um, so the idea you're out of alignment, that you have a torsion of your pelvis, that your QL is the tight, that your pelvis is unlevel, that you're unstable, um, these can all be nocebos. So we're no longer managing people away from load. We realize people are more resilient. They're not as fragile as we thought. Uh, I have many patients that, I have one I've been showing in my webinars. I'm gonna show it today in uh, three, less than two and a half hours. Um, you know what his greatest uh, discovery was? Uh, a, he's a very uh, 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 personable guy who speaks his mind and he, he's 
he's anxious about movement. He's very anxious about movement. He discovered, even though he's an anxious person about movement and lacked self-efficacy, kind of a warrior, he discovered that toe touches were the number one thing that got rid of his flexion intolerance. Toe touches, exactly what a lot of us have believed was something we should avoid. And yet it's what helped him. So I have flexion intolerance who get better with Peter O'Sullivan's approach and I have flexion intolerance that get better with McGill. I'm not so, I'm more comfortable with uncertainty. There's a lot I don't know. And we explore things. Uh, it's usually gonna be plan B. This is the, the approach of science is, is knowing we don't know um, and accepting uncertainty. Things are complex and we learn from our mistakes, plan B. So, so telehealth is the greatest myth buster of all. Who would have thunk that we could actually get uh, uh, high quality best practices results uh, from maintaining arm's length from, uh, from our patients. And it would get us in step uh, with things that could enhance knowledge translation and help us uh, all to implement the guidelines uh, the evidence-based practices that we've been disseminating fruitlessly since uh, the late 1980s. So, um, so that's my little recap, my mea culpa about Rehab of the, Rehab of the Spine second edition. Uh, Laura Mosley chatted with me and we, um, I changed the title of the third edition. It's now a person-centered or patient-centered approach. It's not a practitioner's manual. Um, there's no chapter by Professor McGill in the book. There are chapters on uncertainty. I do not know the specific cause of back pain. I, I fully admit, I am sorry. Um, I do not know. Uh, but I think that that's, um, uh, I think that that sets me up for, for greater agility and more aplomb to be able to navigate the uncertainty and the complexity and the plan B aspects of, of people's ups and downs. Tendinopathies don't get better overnight. It's better to tell somebody that hurt may not equal harm and a tendinopathy may take months than to give them the unrealistic expectation and to do some sort of thumper on their body and they feel good for two days. That's a Band-Aid. Um, chiropractic may be very valuable as a catalyst and I use it, um, but it also can be a cough drop sometimes and not change the, the, the duration or prognosis of a cold, just make a person feel better temporarily. So I wanna put the McKenzie hat on first. I've always taught this in Bournemouth at AECC. Um, he's the greatest revolutionary of all. And he said, if somebody throws their back out, if you know your shit about the spine, if you're an expert, you should be able to, to, to explain to somebody uh, how to put their back back in. Uh, so active care first, self-care first, and then we can back end the passive care. Otherwise, people attribute, like Maureen Simmons, another British expert, a physio, said, um, and I know she was a, a uh, a guest at Bournemouth once or twice. Um, as she said, if the person attributes to you, um, that's not going to help them with their self-efficacy. The goal is they should self-attribute. And when they self-attribute, as Mackenzie teaches, that gives them confidence, that lowers cortisol, uh, it changes their pain tolerance. Then they realize that the hurt may not equal harm, and they, they become more hopeful and so my mission at LA Sports and Spine is to give people tangible hope and an achievable plan. And I do it one way, by giving them a positive experience with movement. Um, so that's, that's what I got for you today. Um, and um, I really appreciate the vine uh, and, uh, and having such, a, uh, such an intelligent audience, uh, such a caring group and, and uh, Neil and Anna, that's just, brings it over the top for me. I had no idea I was gonna see you guys today. So um, blessings to all of you and, and thanks for the time. Craig, can I just ask you, in the context of what we're talking about here, when do you use electronic consultations? When do you use video and, and phone? Because that's really what this group is focusing on. Well, right now I use it exclusively. Uh, it's uh, uh, the, we're, we're considered essential services. But, but it's explained for emergencies to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, choking the ERs. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result, um, I just close my office except for emergencies. So I've encouraged all of my patients uh, take advantage of telehealth as needed. And um, 
you know, as they are, the uh, onboarding process has been really, really smooth. Uh, we've dealt with technology issues. One person just moved. They didn't have good internet. I already did a second session with him. That was cleaned up. Uh, some people have to figure out where to put their laptop. One person wanted to use an iPad. I said, switch to the laptop because you can tilt the screen. Um, I asked them to, to, to take a picture of the area before we do it. I asked them to give me a list, um, the email of what equipment they have. I don't care if they have no equipment. I don't care if they don't have an exercise mat. There's nothing like body weight exercises. You know, it's called yoga. Uh, and yoga isn't just flexibility. Yoga is strength, body weight. Um, so there's so much you can do. Pavel Satsalim, um, the great kettlebell maestro, he said, uh, less options, more focus. Less options, more results. And were you using electronic uh, consultations before the current crisis? Or is it, is it only the current crisis that prompted you to get into them? I, I did, but not that often. Not with my Los Angeles-based pra practice. Um, I've used it on and off for people from abroad, uh, for patients who had moved. So I'd Skyped, I'd gotten on FaceTime, WhatsApp. Um, but uh, now I'm using Zoom. Zoom works great. Um, our compliance regulations as far as encryption are softened during the COVID crisis. Um, so I haven't even had to uh, go to the high encryption uh, level of service that Zoom also offers. Zoom's working great. And Zoom... Uh, records it um, and then I can send the recording to my patients and they can use that as a routine daily and then uh, the next time I visit with them we can tweak so I have people that I see more than once a week and we might do um, you know ab centric thing one day glute centric thing another day we can do leg centric arm centric uh, we can mix and match they can keep these routines on on file to draw from to vary things um, so it's it's been remarkably easy and do, do you think you're going to carry on using it post COVID-19? Oh God. Yeah. Heck yeah. I'm so used to sleeping in. Uh, my son was making fun of me. Uh, so he goes, that's what you're doing. <laughs> you're sitting there on our couch with Harley, our dog. So here's Harley. Harley's just, just napping away next to, next to me. <laughs> Harley loves telehealth. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, great. So I've got some questions which have popped up. So I've got a question from um, Andrew uh, Leo, which just, just disappeared. And he says, if you have a non, so this is from Mike, if you have a non-specific low back pain patient who asks, so is it muscular or joint or is it something else? How do you, com how do you communicate complex pain ideas concisely? Oh gosh. Well, guidelines have always said that, uh, you know, Gordon Waddell and others have always said, uh, we don't know. It's, you know, even Gordon's term mechanical might have been generous. Um, uh, so, you know, you know, if there are red flags, sinister signs of tumor infection, fracture, et cetera, um, you know, if, um, and that's less than 1%, let's say, you know, if um, there are signs of nerve root, let's say it's, you know, eight, 10, 12%, depending upon the, the type of, of social group you're working with. Um, those are easy enough, you know, leg symptoms below the knee, numbness, tingling, et cetera. Um, uh, but the vast majority of people are, are idiopathic, nonspecific. I'm comfortable being honest with people. Um, they want to know, why do I have pain? Of course they want to know. I'm not telling them the pain is in their head. I mean, this whole uh, war between these tribes, these silos of pain science and, uh, and bio, biomechanics, this is a, a non-issue. Um, Peter Stilwell, great chiropractor, did an unbelievable podcast, wrote a great article too on an, the inactive approach where he said, we've forgotten about the social. And I realized, I realized Gordon had always talked about the social as being an equal part of the tripod. And I just blew it off. I like, eh, okay, sounds good, Gordon. I get it. Yeah, it's important. Yada, yada. But the reality is, is that most of these problems are social. So the woman from Wales, the, the the chiropractor from Wales, you know, she said people are expecting adjustments. That's social. We get reimbursed. That's social. These are vested interests. Uh, Ostolo, in his editorial after Lancet, um, talked about how vested interests must be tackled, that this is ultimately what's the ball and chain of this knowledge translation problem of, 
of implementation. We can disseminate all we want. Lancet has been amazing, but it's no different than CSAG or AHCPR 30 years ago. Um, we have the same knowledge translation issue. Hopefully telehealth is going to get us over the hump. Hopefully chiropractors are gonna realize we can guide by the side. Better to be Alfred than Batman. And people will love us for it. So um, uh, I think um, there's a lot of, of, of things we can learn about the biopsychosocial, in particular about the social, and how to uh, uh, give people confidence. And one of the worst things we can do is to mislead people about the source of their pain. Your pain is real, that's number one. It ain't in your head. Um, but is it always in your tissues? An amputee metaphor clearly shows that you can have pain without it being in your tissues. Um, an amputee's pain is real. We validate that. Now, do we know the exact cause? Well, we know it's not something sinister and we can tell you whether it's a pinched nerve or not, 100%. Beyond that, what I like to, to, to do is echo the work of Tim Gabbett, the great sports scientist. It's not the activity that breaks you down, it's the activity you're not prepared for. So we are going to Clint Eastwood this. We are gonna look for at your floor we're going to do a needs analysis of what you require, and then we're going to do a functional assessment of what you have. If you don't have what you need, we now know why you have your pain. It is not the activity that breaks you down, it's the activity you're not prepared for. So we do a deep dive into your floor. Uh, we want to know whether you have the baseline functional prerequisites for sustainable activity. And if you don't know how to squat, we're going to teach you how to squat. If you don't have good balance, we're going to give you a better balance. A lot of it is just programming. It's not even about movement literacy. It's, a, it's, it's are you doing 30 minutes a day of moderate activity? Are you doing twice a week of strength training? Who is? 90% of people over 70 are not. 50% of five-year-olds are not. Are you teaching in Bournemouth these statistics? Because they will wake people up. So don't get me started. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm passionate about this. Like, like why we don't know the evidence when the evidence is telling us all we need to know in order to keep people away from the nocebos, the iatrogenesis that is rampant from misinformation. And we should not be part of that problem. So, so do we need to know whether it's joint or muscular? Boy, I don't think we have robust evidence that our assessment can distinguish joint from muscular. That being said, there are things where diagnosis is relevant. Let's talk about that. There are tissue specific things. Um, for instance, the question of, of hurt and harm. We use the, 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 the light, uh, the, the traffic light. Red light pain, hurt equals harm. And we know it's subjective. So seven out of 10, don't do it. Uh, yellow, it's like crossing the street. If it's yellow, look both ways for your cross. Don't just slam on the brakes, you might get rear-ended. It's stupid to stop if it's four, five, or six often, but sometimes you might. Uh, in children with patellofemoral pain, we now know that yellow is also stop. And we also know if you have bone pain like a shin splint, yellow is also stop. But if you have back pain, yellow probably isn't a stop. So, so there is a place for tissue specific. Um, uh, but when people are worried about green, ah, I'm feeling uh, pain. Oh, how painful is it? Oh, it's, it's mild. But, but you know, is it gonna get worse? Like, like we don't want people hypervigilant about pain. Pain hypervigilance, and it was a great paper, it just came out, email me if you want this, um, came out like a week ago. I mean, it just got released on, on Twitter, it's not even out yet, but it's honoring, it's a homage to the great Stephen Linton from Sweden, who's from Atlanta, but it's been in Sweden forever. The architect with Kendall of the yellow flags forms. And, and l this homage with Vli uh, Vli Vlan and others on fear avoidance, uh, was talking about some of these issues uh, about the assessment and establishing baselines. Um, and in it, they were talking about these ideas of hurt and harm and how important it is not just to focus on negative, but to also focus on positive. So when you take a resilience approach, you're focusing on a person's positive traits. Uh, you're focusing on their confidence. Uh, you're focusing on building up their robustness. But if all we do is focusing on what's wrong, we're focusing on negative traits. In psychology, you can take a, a positive, a positive a fo focus or you can take a negative a fo focus. And we're learning that we don't have to just do the negative, which is what we've always done. 
Yeah, that's really interesting uh, and uh, quite pertinent. Peter Stilwell, if people don't know about him, has just finished his PhD uh, looking at communication and looking at extending the biopsychosocial model, the idea that biological is not different from social, is not different from psychological, and the argument between these three groups are completely, is a complete fallacy, they're totally, totally intertwined. Um, I had the joy of being one of his PhD supervisors, and I've never learned so much from a student in my life. Nearly killed me reading his thesis, <laughs> trying to understand it all. He is talking uh, for the Payne faculty of the Royal College, either next week or the week after, on the use of language and metaphor. Why saying things like motion and is lotion uh, is good, and some of the other metaphors that we might be using, like you know the idea of an, uh, a knotted muscle, can actually be harmful for our patients. So I suggest everyone signs up for that if, if at all they can. Can I do that? Abs abs are you a member of the Royal College? No. Uh, <laughs> maybe we'll let a guest in. Um, I'd so love to. Thank you. Can I say one last thing about Peter? Yeah. So he he and Matt Lowe together uh, have and Diane, Daniela Vaz, a, a physio who is very involved with the, the World Health Organization. She's from Brazil. Um, with helping to clarify what the international classification of functioning is. Uh, our international um, classification system used for disability ratings. Um, the three of them together have done more to help me see it's not about the bio versus the psycho, not about biomechanics versus pain science. And, and in Peter's view, uh, the bifurcation or the dichotomization is false, just, just as you're saying. But he also says if you do a trifurcation, it's false. So he wants us to see it all as very much a muddy thing, a spectrum thing. Um, and it gets to Ostelow's point about vested interests and upstream things as far as social constraints. But what it really helped me to realize was that in the second edition of Rehab at the Spine, I had bought into the, the dichotomization. And when we separated the yellow flags and, the, and looked at pain science as one thing and bio as another, it made us go deep down the rabbit hole of stability and instability of motor control. And it, it wasn't until I started doing my functional training handbook research and wrote the last two chapters of the functional training handbook about motor learning that I realized that the work on motor literacy and movement literacy um, and motor learning is quite different from the literature on motor control. Motor control is over coaching uh, and a bit of a dead end, which is really something that, that I felt like defensive about because I'm the Johnny Appleseed of DNS, for goodness sake. And there's a lot of, of coaching in that. Um, there's a lot of coaching in a lot of the systems about stabilization training. And in motor learning, you create the environment, which, which you know, Paul McCambridge is a master of. You create the environment, you choose the skill that is gonna challenge a person at the edge of their capability. And that, that challenge at the, their edge is what A, gets them in a flow state so you have their attention and, and they have a positive experience with movement, and B, it leads to adaptation, which stimulates all the cortical plasticity. So you get residual adaptation. This is the neurology of, of, of the movement system. If it's too easy, then there's no change. You need to be at their edge. It can't be so hard that they lose technical proficiency, uh, but it has to be something that's gamified. So now we're talking game theory. We're talking behavioral psychology. We're talking constraints-based motor learning. This is the language of motor learning that is not part of the language of motor control. And you have in Great Britain, you have Matt Lowe right down the street from Bournemouth, one of the great uh, 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 architects of this new way of thinking. And of course, Peter Stilwell and, and Daniela Vaz, these are these are, are incredibly articulate people. So email me, I'll send you Matt's editorial, I'll send you Peter's article, his brilliant podcast on this, uh, and also an article on the World Health Organization and ICF's approach and why motor control was a dead end, uh, especially coming from the rehab uh, of stroke and spinal cord and cerebral palsy. It turned out breaking things down into parts and correcting things and controlling them and then hoping they're gonna recapitulate when people have to do functional things like, like prehension and feeding and gait and things like that, um, getting up and down from a chair um, was a fool's errand. And Daniela Vaz brings out all, all of this, this literature and evidence. Um, totally 
threw me back on my heels, put me on my backside, uh, which is why I say Rehab of the Spine Second Edition, um, really a lot of misnomers uh, in there, uh, of which uh, uh, I, feel, I feel okay uh, that I made that mistake, but I say, I say use it for kindling. Just looking for my copy on the shelf so I can throw it out. Yeah, go for it. And if it's uh, <laughs> video that for me, and, and I'll applaud you. Um, it, it was interesting because I, I, I took that book on holiday with me. And it must be, I don't know, how old is it? 20 years? A long, long time ago. And I was, there was a pain consultant there on holiday, kind of loosely in the group. And she saw me reading. And we ended up having this conversation. And we've remained friends ever since. And Kathy Price, she's the clinical lead for a big area of the NHS locally. And we've remained friends ever since based on discussions about some of the stuff that was quite new to me when I started reading. I think it's probably actually version one of your book. But yeah, it made, made a big impact. Um, I've got a question here from uh, Patrick. He says, thanks, Craig. In the real world, what should we say to existing patients who are accustomed to being helped with hands-on treatment to alter their expectations? Should, should we actually... Keep, keep those patients going with what's working for them, they're happy with this and it's working, and just use this new model with new patients, or should we be trying to shift our existing patient base into the new way of thinking? Oh, damn, I love this question. So that's a very honest question. So um, I think anytime you take a new seminar, you learn a new sacred iliac adjustment or fascial technique or, or ART technique, or you start using Graston or Stecco, uh, you learn the SFMA algorithm, I mean, you're hot to trot. Monday morning, you've got any patient who's plateaued, that's fair game. You're calling back your patients that you know you weren't so successful with that were chronic. Um, your current patients that are progressing slowly, you're going, hey, I just learned these new things. So you have a perfect entree with all those people. Now the people that are happy as clams that are doing great, um, you're not going to change things as explicitly. Um, but there's no reason why you don't start to slide some of these things in and start to spend a few more minutes on self-care. Um, ultimately, uh, manual therapy is more evidence-based for recovery, like sleep and, and, and hydration and stress management, um, than it is for acute pain. Uh, the evidence not so robust. So I'm always hearing from people like multimodal is evidence-based. You got the new study from Europe about maintenance chiropractic for chronic pain. Um, you know, I think the overwhelming evidence is still in favor of education and exercise above uh, passive modalities. Passive modalities are low value. It may not be a very um, uh, pro-chiropractic use uh, or turn of a phrase from Lancet, uh, from Jan um, uh, and his colleagues, but um, low value is better than, than evidence of ineffectiveness. <laughs> As Al Breen would say, the lack of evidence of effectiveness is not the same thing as evidence of ineffectiveness. And you've all heard him say that. Um, but let's face it, chiropractic adjustments are low value for low back pain. And musculoskeletal pain in general follows low back pain. So we're not silo-based, as Ben Smith's tremendous article in your British Journal of Sports Medicine uh, recapped. We can take the, the guidelines from low back, we can apply it to musculoskeletal pain in general. Um, so as far as knowledge translation, we should start to um, uh, use the adjustments afterwards. Uh, my patients, they go into my treatment room and I'm getting rid of the treatment rooms. I had four uh, December of, of 2019. I now have two. My uh, gym has gotten bigger. Um, the environment has changed. Therefore, the expectations change. The treatment room is used as a cubby. Drop your shoes off, your keys, take your sweater off. I'll, I'll meet you on the lacrosse ball. Start beast, beast crawling. Let's do some bird dogs. Let's do advanced side planks. Let's start to squat. This is what happens for 35, 40 minutes. We get the heart rate up. We get people sweating. Uh, we challenge them in new ways. We review their self-care. And then if they elect for uh, an adjustment, I'm happy to give an adjustment. I love adjusting people. Um, and we may not even use the table. I've grown more fond of doing the things that Leon Chetow taught me about doing the, the upright thoracic cavitations. Uh, maybe those are osteopathic techniques. I don't know. Um, but um, the less I use the table, the better. Uh, Gary, Jacob, who's been in England many times, he always talked about the ritual of the gown and the expectation for passive care. Um, 
and uh, you know, he almost turned it into like this sexual kind of metaphor where at the end of the session, if it's a female patient, you know, they're like, oh my God, that was so good. You know, this is all negative things about adjustments. Like we're not there to provide a feel good experience. We're there to get to the root of the problem. And if we can show people things that are upstream, no different than a cardiologist. It's like with the cardiologist, it's all about lifestyle. It's about, let's get you more active. Let's alter your diet. And in six months, if your cholesterol hasn't changed, if your triglycerides haven't improved, your blood pressure hasn't come down, I'll give you the Lipitor. So why should we be less than cardiologists? Why should we not prioritize to what people can do for themselves? And in England, you have a big issue with NCDs, bigger than we have even in America. And we know that lifestyle factors, what we call the SNAPs, smoking, nutrition, alcohol, physical activity, and the three S's, stress, social participation, and sleep. These constitute um, factors. You have an editorial in one of your major medical journals just four or five months ago, which, which if you email me and remind me, I'll send to you, um, said constitutes things that can enhance health span uh, by like 10, 12 years. We have data that if you marshal SNAPs, you can improve your biological age by 19 years, but not through passive care. When you, what do you mean when you say NCDs? I'm not familiar with that acronym. Non-communicable diseases. Okay. Right. Of which right. musculoskeletal pain is number one. Diabetes, heart disease, cancer are, are after. We have the new data on the costs of musculoskeletal diseases versus uh, cancer and heart disease and diabetes. Musculoskeletal pain costs more than those all put together. Yeah, so I think that report you're talking about may not be may be in a, in a journal, but it's our chief medical officer produced a report on year, li, years live with the disability. Yes, right. It was, it was it was smoking. It was alcohol abuse. It was um, was it was what, what you eat, what you drink, what you smoke, and how much you move. They're the kind of the the, the four things that, that that change change the life. So if if we move in the direction you're talking about. What differentiates a chiropractor from a good PT, from a good osteopath? Hopefully nothing. Okay. Good answer. Uh, Greg Rose uh, said this uh, years ago. If, you, if, if, so, if uh, somebody can tell the difference between the PT and the chiro, then neither is, is best practice. Yeah. So I'm just looking through the questions here. I mean, a, a challenge we've then got, I, I work on exclusively in our, in our, our state healthcare. And the state would say, why should I employ a chiropractor? Why should I go through and understand and register take on chiropractors if, if the PTs can do the same? And that, that's a big challenge that I've, I've been facing. Well, right now, there's one big difference. We have evidence that PTs do not know the World Health Organization guidelines for physical activity. We do not have such evidence for chiros. Yeah. Furthermore, we had evidence uh, years ago, again, from Ostelo, uh, Raymond Ostelo, uh, that uh, PTs... Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, were of a biomedical uh, uh, belief system. And they shared biomedical beliefs that were nocebos, that were iatrogenic, that made people lack confidence. Uh, Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, whereas we have two or three such studies, maybe four, even five with physios, I am not aware of one on Kairos. That being said, I'm not aware of one that said we, we weren't. Uh, but we have evidence of ineffective uh, mindset and nocebo behavior amongst physiotherapists. Uh, I don't see such evidence, although I'd be, you know, sur wouldn't be surprised if it's there. But uh, yeah. is that is that the case, Neil? Do you know? We we have done studies which show that chiropractors do tend to have a biomedical bent. That's, that's oh, we sure. do. We do too. Guilty as charged. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, an argument that I I throw back is that if you want somebody to work in an independent professional position, a graduate chiropractor is more skilled at making a diagnosis and carrying out a thorough assessment than a PT who, who's trained across a rock. You know, don't give me a, a rehab patient or a you know a, a, a chest declare because I haven't got a clue. A, re, a re, post surgical rehab, I mean, rather than a general rehab. That's kind of the argument I use. We have a different training which takes us to a a sharper point of education and ability within a narrower sphere earlier on. You know, I, I prefer to employ chiropractors where I can for primary primary care work. That's an important point. I, I think you're right that the physios 
who are respiratory specialists, they're going to be in the COVID centers. Um, the physios who are neuro trained are going to be ideal for strokes and spinal cord. Um, uh, so there's neuro and respiratory and and specialists like that, uh, that are in physio that you won't find in Cairo. But most physios are general, general practitioners. So, so a, grad, a graduate physiotherapist is a generalist. A graduate chiropractor, is, we have quite a narrow focus to it. We, we can then go and change, but actually we operate quite, quite narrowly. Um, I've got a question here from Anna Franklin, who says, Craig, does your approach mean that you just see fit patients? Many of mine are over 70 and simply couldn't do any kind of plank. And so if you've never set foot in a gym. Hi, Anna. So, uh, no, I have 95-year-olds. Uh, uh, in my webinar, I'm showing Beverly Hills Betty, who's in her early 90s, doing a better bird dog than most people. Um, absolutely not. Uh, what we do is, is, is ideal for the deconditioned and the unfit. And mind you, be aware of a little-known uh, effect of COVID-19. The survivors who were in the ICUs and on respirators, severe deconditioning, 1% atrophy per day. They are going to need uh, specialists in rehabilitation to help uh, rebuild their balance so they're not at risk of a catastrophic fall and to rebuild their strengths so they don't become frail um, and to onboard them. And it's going to be a huge issue in societies all over the world, um, but, um, you know, over half our population is, is sedentary. Professor Yonda warned of the dangers of sedentarism uh, in the 1960s. And by the 1980s, we had the evidence that we're sitting more and moving less. Uh, grip strength is down 15% since 2000. Uh, falls are up 400% since 2000. Uh, if you don't know how to handle inactive people, um, then um, you're not a rehab specialist. We should be able to handle those people. Those are right in our wheelhouse. Asymptomatic people who are sedentary are right in our wheelhouse. And therefore, people with back pain who are sedentary, who've been given the nocebo, oh, we have to calm things down before we build them up. Oh, we need to blah, 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 do all these floor exercises. Go back in time and look at one of the pioneers of rehab, uh, not uh, Gary Gray, but the other Gray. Uh, uh, I mean, not Gray Cook, but the other Gray, Gary Gray. Gary said, don't keep people on your table. Don't keep people doing recumbent floor exercises. Uh, get people upright. 90-year-olds need to squat in order to avoid independent living. 12-month-olds can squat better than adults. Cradle to grave, we need to be able to maintain foundational movement literacies. Nothing is more foundational than the squat. Now, if you want to prevent a fall in 70-year-olds, it's single leg bias. It's lunging. Most 75-year-olds are, are, are hesitant about lunges. Um, they're afraid if they fall, they can't get up. So we got to train it. We got to find the hardest thing they do well. A supported lunge uh, would be an ideal example. So we don't manage people away from load. Uh, when they're already deconditioned, we explain that that's why they have pain. It's not the load that breaks you down. It's a load you're not prepared for. So we want to stop this nocebo that people are fragile and we need to correct them. Uh, we wanna teach people, as, as you just said, the motion is the lotion. And if you want your body to feel better, feel your body move better. So, so we can brand this for people. Um, they should feel strong. We wanna stop giving people fear of flexion. Oh my God, uh, the studies are clear now. That doesn't mean there aren't isolated cases of flexion intolerance. Um, uh, that should avoid flexion temporarily. Uh, and it doesn't mean that power lifters shouldn't learn how to hinge, um, goodness sakes. Um, but um, we've been managing people away from load. We are part of the problem. Uh, Hippocrates said, first do no harm. And Dr. Levitt said, the first treatment is to teach people to avoid what harms them. Maybe it's us. Maybe it is our adjustment. Maybe it is our, our, our infatuation and the fact that we are also a crack addict. Okay, I love the sound of the adjustment. I love it. I, I, it, it gives me, it's a high. And, and to a lot of people, it's a high. But, but the first time, maybe it lasted a year, the second time a month, the third time a week, the fourth time, uh, uh, two or three days until finally it just feels good for 10 minutes. So there's nothing wrong with adjustments. There's nothing wrong with passive care. 
Everything has its place. Everything has its place. But what we say has a huge impact. And we want to reassure and reactivate the sine qua non since the 19, late 1980s of best practices. And we've failed. Knowledge translation is poor. We've disseminated but not gotten good implementation in the trenches. And maybe it's because we're holding on to some of these beliefs. So uh, we're all going to have to go in a few minutes. We have a thing called the NHS clap and everyone's going to go outdoors at eight o'clock and bang pots and pans and clap and cheer for our National Health Service. Eight o'clock, the whole country is going to do it. So we've, we've got a couple of uh, One last question. And I've got, I've got some other ones which I'm going to email to you. They're really quite specific about okay. techniques and stuff I don't, I don't really understand. And I've got loads of questions saying, yes, Jonathan, get the I'm list. I'm not going to understand either. <laughs> get, the, get the list of references from Craig. Can I have the papers? Well, I've been listening and writing, so I haven't kept it track. So if you can link them to me or put them on the Slack group, that would be great. But a question from Mark Sanders, which I think is really quite a key question is, have you had any realization through this enforced change that may change the way you practice face-to-face -face in future? Mm. Yeah, so I've learned that, um, I've learned that my patients do better independently than I, than, than I realized. Um, I realized that giving them a video of a routine has a role. I've been giving people videos of the new self-care exercises, but not a video of a 40 minute uh, 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 workout. And so now that I'm doing the telehealth, it's about 40 minutes per, per interaction. Um, and then they get the recording. Um, and then I say, do that until we meet again. So I think that's one of the things is, is, is the ability to give them that whole workout. Um, besides that, it's just reinforcing, reinforcing that people uh, with encouragement can push themselves hard on their own. Um, I think we've been selling people short. Um, and I think it's also reinforcing that um, we're on the right track. So, so Dr. Levitt, there's a blog on firstprinciplesofmovement.com on the key link isn't a thing. And a lot of people, including myself, misinterpreted his teachings. We thought he was always teaching us to find the key link and he who treats the site of symptoms as loss, find the key link that's causing the trouble. Um, and we thought it was like the fibular head or a stuck fascia or something else, the dead foot. Um, but I dug in more deeply in the last few years after Matt Lowe opened my eyes about biomechanics and motor control and stability. And I reread Dr. Levitt's book, Rehabilitation of the Motor System. And it turns out for him, a lot of the psychology and the environmental factors were part of the key link that's causing the trouble. So I wrote a blog that the key link isn't a thing using all of Dr. Levitt's quotes. And it's not just about the psycho, it's about the social. And of course, there's a place for the bio too. Um, so, you know, the key link isn't a thing. In the office, like, we're all like gadget man. We're, we're fix it guys, we're Batman. You know, your, your hip internal rotation is off and I know how to fix that and do this corrective exercise. Um, it, it's less about that. It's more about finding the, the, the weaknesses and giving people confidence. And telehealth has just reinforced that active care trumps passive care, that self-care is the most evidence-based form of active care, um, that self-care uh, changes expectations in your patients um, it violates expectations. It disproves the belief that hurt equals harm and that activity is dangerous. These were the, the two things that were uh, the purpose of reassurance, along with dispelling the myth of pathoanatomy and that, that imaging we're telling the, telling the whole story. Um, so telehealth is, is consistent with self-care and active care and rehab. And we're just getting a, a further proof that we were on the right track all along. And I think we should all continue um, to do what, what we know is in the best interest of patients. And that is to show people what they can do for themselves. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Craig. That's been really, you know, loads of great comments. If you see the video later on, you'll see all the comments coming in from the side. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, I'll, I'll repost the link to the references Craig's given us if he gives them to me. So thank I'll give them to you today. To that. A uh, big thank you to the Royal College of Chiropractors who are using, giving us their huge Zoom hosting facility for it. Uh, we'll get CPD certificates out to, I guess, everyone, not just those who want it. The rest of you can just ignore it if you don't. <laughs> thank everyone very much. Quick rush outside and clap to the NHS. Bye. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Jonathan. Bye, Neil. Bye, Anna. <laughs>